Raro, our Romney Reckoners. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the video. Thanks. <laughs> Today we're going to be going through Romney A Reckoning by McKay Coppins, who is a, a writer for The Atlantic, which... Love The Atlantic. Yeah, they've had to produce a lot of good stuff over the years. Didn't Mark Twain write for The Atlantic? This book is really interesting. It was written after like some 45 interviews <clears throat> with Mitt Romney. He was given access to Mitt Romney's journals and a bunch of like emails and correspondences. So it's like a very intimate and claims to be like the most intimate book of a sitting politician Damn. ever written. It is quite insightful. So Mitt Romney sat for this book, so to speak. Like he engaged with the book. He was part of the process. It's not like a speculative piece. It's like yes, this he, he was deeply very involved. reputable journalist got to interview the subject matter directly forty five times. 45 times. I can't imagine doing anything 45 times. <laughs> <laughs> I know. For backup, Mitt Romney ran for president in 2012. I remember because we were at BYU-Idaho. Yep, I remember so watching. So we all wanted Romney to win because he was Mormon. I didn't. I, I hated Mitt Romney. Except for Tamar. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to see this, the like poetic, uh, the poeticism playing out in my mm. personal feelings toward Mitt Romney because as a believing Mormon, as a member of the Rexburg College Republicans, Oh. I was a, a diehard Ron Paul guy. I actually you... met Mitt Romney wearing a, a homemade tie-dye Ron Paul Revolution shirt. <laughs> Which was sick, by the way, and I owned that for years afterwards and loved it. I love how you've dressed like your former Republican self today. Oh, I yes. guess I'm a Democrat because yeah. Taylor Swift and Navy. Oh, red and blue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I didn't like him at the time. I, I felt that he was too uh, war hawkish. Mm -hmm. that he was playing into crony authoritarianism and the corruption present in the Republican Party. Basically all this stuff that I complained about the Republican Party. And then, you know, shortly after graduating, I was just kind of like, uh, I'm so done with this party. Basically for all the stuff that he acknowledges in the mm -hmm. book. And so it was like somewhat validating to be like, wow, I'm, I'm glad you finally saw that. The rest of us saw it in 2012. Yeah, so you at like 23 didn't really like him for reasons that he now at what, however old he is, 60? Yeah, oh, he's in his 70s I think now. He looks incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's his skincare routine we need to know? Really a handsome man, we can move on quickly from this point, but I was like looking at his uh, Instagram the other day and I was like, he's perfect for being a politician. Like, it's, it's like if Pixar made yeah, a governor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, so true. And he does have this kind of like, aw shucks, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Joseph Smith goes, to Washington, goes to Washington kind of vibe that in hindsight is pretty in, like endearing. At the time I was like, mm. this guy, like, and keep it, you know, I say that I, I had some criticisms. I was also a total idiot at the time. Yeah. yeah. And still am. The more yeah. I learn about politics and world affairs and I'm, I try to stay pretty abreast and I'm always trying to learn. And the more I learn, the more I'm like, I don't know jack shit. Yeah. Like, and I don't think anyone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Obviously, that yeah. Also, we're like eight billion humans trying to navigate a life on the same planet together. That's going to be too many moving parts for most yeah. of us to be able to fit in a coherent narrative. Clawing out of rigid ideologies that yeah. have, you know, uh, been imposed on the human mind for thousands of years. Stark. Uh, um, ideological and uh, ethnic um, tribalism. It's tough. Yeah, we kind of have a rough predicament here and we're just trying to do the best we can and gratefully that some people are reckoning. Yeah. Uh, Mitt Romney's dad was governor of Michigan and as I understand it, as it's put forward in the book, he's kind of like a rags to riches kind of guy. Like okay. one of those real old fashioned self-made men who like started off with nothing and grad until he became the governor of New York and, how did or he, excuse me, not New York, Michigan. How did he climb? Was it just through politics or did he, was he? Business, business primarily. Um, labor in a third world country or? Um, I don't do we know anything? So. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. That's just what I assume. It would be interesting to get more uh, insight into his father's career and legacy. Obviously this is just like mostly Romney's glowing mm -hmm. uh, memories of his dad and kind of like, Right, sets yeah. uh, highlighting Mitt's drive to enter the politics. I guess his dad was like a really principled guy, at least in the areas that are acknowledged in the book. Um, he marched with uh, Dr. King during the civil rights movement, one of the only uh, Republican. Republicans to do that. Um, and was in a lot of like social ways very progressive, even though financially conservative. Mm -hmm. And then when Mitt... Uh, then ran for governor and became governor of um, Massachusetts. 
he likewise was very socially uh, liberal. While, In what ways? Uh, he uh, protected abortion laws. Damn. He was pro-gay marriage. Damn. He, um, I didn't know that. He was one of the uh, few governors to... So I thought this was a really interesting part, part of the <clears> book. <throat> he went in feeling like... The whole thing is like Mitt really worried about his legacy, not just his personal power. He's got plenty of money. He was born rich. Mm. He, he made even more money. Like, he, I'd be worried about my legacy if I was me. And so a lot of his thing is like, how are people, how are my children going to think about me? What are people in a hundred years going to think about mm. me? And which is, is noble. And mm. has, is that kind of like old timey classical sense of statesmanship is like, what can I leave for people? And at least in the book, Mitt's genuine desire to affect positive change and leave a positive legacy stays consistent, even though at various points he bends on his, uh, right. on his principles and, you know, massages the truth a little bit. And that is something that he also reckons with and the self-awareness is refreshing. Uh, so yeah, pretty conservative or pretty, uh, socially liberal governor. And like with the healthcare thing, they talk about how he was like, you know, meeting with all these state leaders and things. And he was like, what would make the biggest difference to the most amount of people in this state? And everyone was like, if you want to make a huge difference, healthcare for everybody. Universal That's why healthcare. Obama was pet thing was healthcare is because that exact same line of thinking as it's told in Michelle Obama's book, which yes. is, I mean, it's true, right? It's like literally whether we live or die. Yeah. And it's funny because Romney care sort of became this blueprint mm. that Obamacare was based off. So later there was like this like struggle to both say like Romney care is a blueprint for how this could be extended to the nation, obviously with changes because it might not be scalable to a national system. And then, like, trying to backtrack and him trying right. to become a purebred conservative to run for president. Obviously, everyone saw through it, and it didn't work out for him in the end. Oh, you feel like people in 2012 kind of saw through that he's not this purebred yes. conservative. Yes, yes. That um, is so interesting. Do you think all the socially liberal stuff, do you think that's, like, him having a libertarian streak? Like, with wanting to, like, gay marriage and abortion? I... I it kind of is this like classic liberal libertarian mm. streak, which is like the government should um, exist to protect f individual freedoms for as many people as possible, mm. including like the right to marry who you want. Um, and like with abortion, of course, that's like a personal freedom issue. And I, uh, it doesn't go in into all of his like philosophy surrounding it. So I can't speak a ton to it. I think he just was in like a more liberal area where it was just kind of like, yeah, of course. Yeah, Massachusetts. Where it wasn't like this big political strain of like, oh, you have to be this diehard aligned mm. with the party. The Republican Party really has changed a lot in the last decade and this is yeah. a witness to that. Yeah. Um, so when he started running for um, presidential nominee, is where and and we see this with pretty much every Republican president where they have to pretend like they're a rabid diehard conservative who's yeah. totally aligned with the party in order to win the general election to coddle the evangelicals. It's just it's known that that that's mm -hmm. how it has to be played. But for him, it kind of became this thing of like, oh, I see that I'm really fudging my principles mm -hmm. quite a bit, and uh, his discomfort with that process shines through. Mm. So let's get into it. Here's an example. He says, during one rally, he'd later recall, the crowd, ro the crowd roared with approval after he called for the repeal of the death tax. This was not a position he felt strongly about, but no one ever lost a Republican primary supporting a tax cut. What's and the, the line tax? usually got a, a good response. Uh, basically, when someone really, really rich dies... The money that the children inherit is taxed. Inheritance tax, as we call it in the UK. Um, at least that's what I think this particular thing is talking about. So he says, the estate tax, which was designed as a bulwark against entrenched, entrenched aristocracy by limiting the amount of wealth passed from one generation to the next, only applied to fortunes of $2 million or more. Repealing it probably wouldn't help a single one of the farmers or mechanics or middle-class office workers in the audience. So why were they all cheering? The answer, he realized, was kind of a grim team loyalty. Mm. This is what my side is for, so this is what I support. 
It all felt so absurd in that moment, so bleak. As are his words. He chose not to dwell on it that thought for too long. Um, that is the author's words speaking, oh, summing up his feelings what? for it. That is so interesting. That's such a classic example of, uh, yeah, like how many people in that audience made $2 million? I mean, probably almost none. Mm-hmm. And they're cheering for a thing that would help them, you know, have better schools, better healthcare, better, you know, anything. Yep. Yeah, so interesting. Here he talks about Iowa. So um, in the American presidential election, the, they have a poll in Iowa, which, which is kind of seen as the like harbinger of how right. the general election will go. And it's always a big deal. And when he went to it, he just thought it was the most like circusy, like just silly thing mm. ever. But he found himself like having to play the game and eat the Twinkies and. Uh, uh. You have to eat Twinkies to become an American president. He had to eat a bunch of fried Twinkies. I think he actually likes Twinkies. He seems like a Twinkie hot dog guy. Good for him. Hot dogs Um, and Twinkies. But yeah, he talks a lot about his disdain for that. Just like a little bit of pretending to care about stuff that you don't actually care about. And then this one is a little more grim. He said he made a point in one of the debates um, that kind of went against a diehard conservative point. And he got really booed for talking about how he could save lives. And he said, uh, it was the rank commitment to dogma over practical outcomes. It was a little ironic, he'd grumble to me years later, that saving human lives was seen by some as being disqualifying in a Republican primary. What, in what context was he talking about saving lives? Oh, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I assume. Um, or, you know, it could apply to, like, saving lives through abortion. I don't know what the specific thing is, but, like, it's this idea that, like... Um, saving lives isn't a sexy position for Republicans. Oh, yeah, we're, I must have missed the other thing because he talks about... Um, people yelling from the audience, like, let him die, let him die. Like, what happens if this person doesn't have health care, can't afford it, but and everyone's just like, let him die. Lord. I remember watching the debates, and uh, when Ron Paul proposed a, like, a golden rule for international relations, like, we shouldn't go and start wars in foreign countries, we should treat our, you know, the people of the world how we want to be treated, and the whole audience full of Christian people booed. Mm. And I was just like... What? Because to them, it's like you're quitting one of the sports that they like. You're saying we're not doing that sport anymore. Yep. So grim. Yep. This is that thing that I was looking for. He said, during a primary debate, a CNN moderator asked how the healthcare system should handle an uninsured man in a coma who needed intensive care to survive. Scattered shouts of let him die (gasps) rippled through the audience. So much for pro-life, Romney wrote in his journal. That kind of stuff all the time. Where you're like, oh my God, this like partisan tribalism is overwhelming our total like our sense of humanistic morality of empathy and compassion it's wild it's interesting for me to think about that also being the case as far back as 2012 because i think i've sort of been under the impression that the republican party really became unhinged like a re- not that it, i mean i suppose george bush as well but i don't know it seems like it's been like a recent thing Mm -hmm. so hearing that that's for some that surprises me like that's something I wouldn't even now that would be really surprising to hear but for some reason I imagined that things were a bit more uh PC (laughs) back in 2012 yeah it is kind of weird because uh, like George Bush was a terrible president like you know you go back and we've got Reagan and Nixon and these people who did like horrible things that empowered uh, rich people and penalized poor people. And yet the way that the politics happened was this like PC elder Mm. statesman kind of like uh, compassionate uh, overseer, you know, Mm -hmm. but and if we helped the man in the coma, we'd only be enabling him. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It's actually kind of. So make him it's fight for it's not life. like the Republican Party was this like noble good thing beforehand, but the vibes were definitely different. And he kind of this is uh, <clears throat> he goes into some of the the architecture of that transition, mm-hmm. and he pins it a lot on Newt Gingrich, who was also running for president at the time. Horrible little man. <laughs> a horrible, yeah, impish, Newt, a man yeah. called Newt who lives up to the name. He said, the truth, of course, was that Newt Gingrich, an architect of the modern Republican Party, understood something visceral about Tea Party voters that Romney wouldn't realize until later. Romney kept trying to project a cool rationality onto their behavior and demands to take their agenda at face value. 
he continued to nurse a delusion that he could win them over with policy. I listened to the words they spoke instead of looking behind it saying, oh, these people that are basically, oh, these are people that are basically anger, angry, he'd later tell me. They weren't interested in policy. They didn't care about the budget or the deficit. They just wanted someone who was going to blow everything up. Mm. Foreshadowing God. Yeah, yeah. And I guess he didn't quite, wasn't able to quite realize that. that I posted this on Twitter that like this whole book is basically Mitt Romney being like, at every single turn being like, wow, everyone in my party is constantly doing the worst things, promoting the worst ideas and empowering the worst people. But at least we're not Democrats. <laughs> mm. And and this whole time you're just like begging like him to like realize like or ask like to what end? Mm-hmm. Like if if you if the architects of this party are concerned with just stoking people's anger and antagonism that they don't care about balancing the budget. They don't care about small government. And he talks about it in this too. Like he's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go in there like a oh I forgot to talk about Mitt Romney's Olympics history. So he also quit his job at Bain Capital to save the S- the Salt Lake Olympics when, surprise, surprise, the Olympic Committee fell into corruption and were guilty of, like, bribing uh, Olympics officials and stuff. So no. they all resigned. Romney came in, uh, you know, saved the Olympics, and there are, of course, disagreements for how much movie. he was responsible for it or not. But the fact is that the... The Olympics were a relative success, and and he was spearheading the effort. So he kind of goes in there with this like business mentality, and his his work at Bain Capital was basically going in, gutting companies, laying off thousands of people, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know trimming costs down to the bare necessities so that they could turn around and be profitable. Mm-hmm. And there is some recollection of his where he's like, now, you know he has a little bit more compassion for the individuals who lost their jobs as a result Mm -hmm. of his trying to empower and enrich business owners. So that's part of his reckoning too. It is like his self-awareness is really refreshing throughout the book. Because you can see he's like a total spoiled rich kid. Like he was born rich. It talks about how he got Mm -hmm. in trouble with the law a lot because he was such a prankster and he never got, never actually got in trouble because he was the governor's son. And it's like, yeah, he worked really, really hard all through his Harvard career. But the only reason he went to Harvard was because again, he was a rich governor's son. And so like he has these conservative principles of like, Oh, if you work hard, the world will work good for you. And if you have principles, the, you know, things will work to your betterment. And it's like, yeah, but you are only able to say that because your run-ins with the law didn't result in you being incriminated for the rest of your life because of your privilege. Mm-hmm. It, whereas, you know, a poor Mexican American who had a run-in with the law is going to, you know, see a few years in jail and then it's going to ruin his work history for the rest of his life. You know, like mm-hmm. it's so his, his blind spots are very present. But again, this whole thing is kind of him being like, Yep, I can see how <laughs> how I'm that way, and I understand why people don't like me, and I understand why people see me as a rich, entitled, mm. spoiled brat, and I can see the ways that I've justified myself to for my own empowerment, and the way that everybody tell you know justifies their murky mm. morals in order to you know do empower themselves or you know to. Yeah. And to it, seek their own. It would be easy for us. And betterment. Uh, you know, people with less privilege, it's probably pretty easy to read this book and like see his blind spots. And it's also just so rare to have a politi- politician displaying the level of self awareness he is displaying. Yes. And there's almost something to be said for like sometimes, I mean, who's to say what's good or bad, I think is kind of the principle behind it. I suppose I'm thinking about Mormon stories right now and how they try not to get too political because they have a bigger impact on. Uh, but on Mormons and and uh, ex Mormons, almost by being less political, I feel like they almost do get people away from conservative style thinking than if they were overtly political. And like John's, let me go on Mormon stories and you know like uh, preach my gospel. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, I just think that's uh, an interesting thing to think about. Like, it takes all types, I guess, is the thing I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm really happy that this book exists in the way that it does. And also, self awareness isn't really something you can fake. Like, if you're able to read that Mitt Romney is, you know, saying these statements, then, like, that is, that is like, real, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, otherwise his brain wouldn't even 
think to pretend it unless there was the awareness that it needed to yeah, yeah. so uh yeah i don't know try to be positive in all the ways that his ego is responsible for driving him he is like t- aware of yeah. and acknowledges and i think part of the reason why he uh like couldn't make it on the national stage is he didn't have the narcissism like Mm -hmm. you know at every turn he's blaming himself versus like look at someone like trump who or you know joseph smith or any other egomaniac or narcissist who is like everything is everyone else's problem always like you're to blame i'm always and power is number one exactly exactly i've always wondered my why more people uh like romney but i also think of like the kardashians and just anyone with like a lot of power and wealth and and success why they don't quit Mm-hmm. And and I do think a lot of the time it is kind of the narcissism or the hunger for power. And the fact that he is quitting politics makes me sad because I wish he could be affecting change with, you know, the man he's become. But also I'm like, that is what a reasonable person would want to do in that situation. There's no mm-hmm. way I'd be able to hack it out Oh no! after all of that. Like that, that's to me does say something pretty positive about him that he isn't interested in that chase anymore. And, it is a fucking clown and who knows, maybe maybe there will be more. I'm sure that this book is part of his like Rebrand. wanting to affect change. Yeah. And you know, he's he's sort of with the mentality of like, yes, I've been very privileged, yes, I've been handed this stuff, and therefore <clears throat> my responsibility is to try to help as much as I can to leverage this power for good. Yeah. Of course it's also I have a car elevator in my three hundred million dollar estate. Yeah, <laughs> I, but I hope he doesn't just spend the rest of his life doing like venture capital bullshit. And... I don't think he. Well, this 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 is what comes through is like he definitely feels an even if it's an egoic need to be of use mm-hmm. to make a difference, and he feels he talks about like after you know quitting the race, dropping out um, of this like profound sense of boredom that overtook him and his like mm. desire to God, get back into the fray to solve problems. And so I don't, you know, even he is older and he talked about, you know, handing it off to the next generation, which... I'm like, you're young compared to some of the people we're dealing with at this point. But I I wouldn't be surprised if we still see him involved in some capacity. Um, Because it seems like he just has that that drive. And honestly, his, like, even his fiscal conservatism isn't that off-putting for me. It's like... It's cool that he went in there with like a genuine desire to balance the budget, for instance, or to, you know, to create a government that's spending within its means. I think that's a responsible thing to do. He also saw that like you can't just eliminate national debt in one go or you'll throw the whole uh, country into a depression. And then he yeah. got booed by conservatives because for doesn't saying the that. Doesn't the GDP like, hinge on student debt at this point? Yeah, and you know, that, it's yeah. like, so he's, it's just a fascinating character and we can, we can keep Keep diving in. Here's him reckoning with Obama from the presidential race. Um, so at the time, just for a little context, he included a, the author included a, a few comments from prominent conservatives during the time Obama was running for office. This says Obama sworn in as the 44th president. Glenn Beck said, this president, I think, has exposed himself as a guy over and over and over again, who has a deep-seated hatred for white people and the white culture. Uh, He mentions that gun sales soared in the United States. The Texas governor said uh, secession is possible. Rush Limbaugh, when you're dealing with a guy like Obama and the Democrat Party, who are going to impose Nazi-like socialism policies in this country, you've got to say it. Sarah Palin said, my parents or my baby with Down syndrome will have to stand in front of Obama's death panel uh, so his bureaucrats can decide whether they are worthy of health care. Oh no, a other, baby would like... do really well under a death panel. <laughs> but it wouldn't be like that anyway. You could still buy the private insurance that you think is like so amazing. Yeah, It's like if you're in England and you're worried that you're, they're not going to let a baby die. But I'm like, you know you can buy your own health insurance. In England, I think private health insurance is still less than what the average American is paying here. So, mm. I mean, you have options. You're not just like at the mercy of these de- the death panel thing. Don't just don't let me. <laughs> we just don't c- get off can't that. overstate the amount of paranoid mm. hype yeah. that uh, conservatives were like Obama around. hating white people. I haven't seen a single shred of it. <laughs> like, of course he doesn't hate white people. <laughs> That's just unhinged. Oh, and it's all, it's like, this is the end of the country. There, this is, it's going to be a socialist hellhole. The death squads are going to be marching through the streets. Like, this is the kind of paranoid antagonism that they were all propagating. And then for what? Like, Obama's presidency came and went. 
And yeah. here we are. Mitt Romney at the time talked, had some criticisms about Obama. He said at first that he was like uh, charming, but not like not principled, uh, graceful, but not full of grace. And went on about, and then he said, uh, he wrote in his journal that he had seen every level of dishonesty I had not imagined in him. He and his team lie time and time again. His in arrogance his journal, is breathtaking. This man should not be the most powerful man in the world. Yeah, because he's, you know, they're running attack campaign ads against each sure. other, and I'm sure he's just constantly sure. like, what? How could people? And that's his whole thing is like, how could people say this about me? And sometimes you're like, well, because they had good reason. And other times you're like, oh, okay, mm. I guess that. Yeah, and it would hurt if someone released an attack ad on you. I'd be fuming in my journal, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And to his credit, like, when Trump is out there saying, the news media is the enemy of the people, and, you know, wanting to uh, basically clamp down on the free press, which is the most, like, one Nazi of the most fascist... Yeah, yeah, exactly. He said, I don't, I don't care that people... It's hard to hear people writing bad things about me, but I would much rather be able for them much rather have them be able to do that than to say you're not allowed to. Yes. You know, I may disagree with what you have to say, but I'll fight to your, to, I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, so it's glad, I'm glad to see him maintaining that uh, liberal value. Yeah. So now as he's reckoning with Obama, Mitt says... Um, this is kind of present day or, you know, recently-ish. By the end of the 2012 campaign, he genuinely bought into his own rhetoric about how the country was at a crossroads, how giving his opponent another term would set the nation on a dangerous course, how he could save America from oblivion, and how this was the most important election of his lifetime. With some distance, he could see that he'd inflated the stakes of the race and the malevolence of his opponent in his own Ooh, mind. Ooh, interesting. Presidents, he would come to believe, had less influence over the, the broad macroeconomic forces than both parties like to pretend. Yeah. He said, quote, I vastly overstated how bad Obama was for the country and the, econ- and the economy. I think what presidents accomplish by virtue of their personal character is at least as great as what they accomplish by virtue of their policies. And in that respect, he believed Obama's record would hold up well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Again, I remember watching the debates between Obama and Romney and like having more culturally in common with Romney, but being against him, having less politically and culturally in common with Obama. But I remember at the time being like, but dang, if he's not charismatic, if he's not like, yeah, I like really admired him as a person, even though I disagreed with him. Uh And of course, eventually I was like, eh. Um, also, can I just say, uh, Obama choosing to do a David Attenborough-style narrator job for that Netflix nature show after he left office, mm. I'm like, that tells me something. <laughs> I'm not saying Obama's perfect, or, you know, we could bitch about Obama too, but uh, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah, says something. I'm like, imagine if Trump just went back to, Trump should just host a fucking off-the-wall Netflix dating show that would be number one on Netflix. We could all like give him the <laughs> adoration he wants in a way that isn't, you know, gonna like tank the entire planet. Uh-huh. We can just like people would quote everything he said. They would put him on. Do you know what I mean? Like he mm. could have this cult of personality in a relatively unproblematic way if he like just do a fucking dating show or something. Like, yeah. I want to see him hosting Love is Blind. Like, that's what he's cut out for. But that doesn't do nearly as well as stoking antagonism and anger. Yeah. But I'm like, I think he'd have more fun. Like, he didn't <laughs> have fun being president. He wasn't, like, enjoying it. No. Ugh. I love the power and the intrigue and yeah. the gossip. And he talks, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of the book is dedicated to Trump. And even in the beginning, he talks about his, like, first meetings. And he's just like, wow, this is a silly, deeply unserious man. <laughs> But he's like, but also very funny. He just like, you know, bah, 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 will say whatever he says. And just like, okay. Said that? Yeah. Hear me out. A season of Love Island, but Trump is in the villa the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he's not necessarily competing for the effect, but he's just there. He's a presence. That would be so sick. As long as there's a very strong uh, Trump can't touch rule that is monitored. Yeah. Otherwise, he's going to get his grubby little paws all over everyone. That's so true. Here's Mitt Romney reckoning, beginning to reckon with religion. Oof. Because he sees the intersections, the way that conservative politics are largely influenced by 
uh, conservative religion, especially in his own Mormon camp. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, every single meeting with like a prominent Republican in this book is him walking away being like, this guy is so dumb. Like, this is so dangerous. Never again. Like even in later meetings with Trump, he's like trying to like sneak in the back of Mar-a-Lago, like Mm -hmm. with things over his head. So people can't take pictures and link him to Trump. Like he has, he's trying to play the game and realizing that in order to succeed at politics, you got to chum up with the worst people. You got to say stuff you don't really mean. It's yeah. a bad rap. And I can see why someone with his disposition like wants to be, I have no desire to enter politics. It sounds like, it sounds like hell. It really does. But in a European kind of election, I really think you'd be good <laughs> in politics. Um, also, this is a fun time to mention that when we were interns at Deseret Book, we were part of the premiere for the Meet the Mormons movie. Oh yeah, we saw him there. Mormons is now a slur for Satan. Uh, and we saw <laughs> Mitt Romney in the flesh, just as gorgeous as, you, as you'd think. And he sat next to Jeffrey R. Holland, didn't he? Oh, in, I During about the movie. That. And they were chatting it up. Hmm. Just interesting. He always kind of has an expression, like he feels uncomfortable, like he doesn't belong there. Like always this like, <clears throat> kind of just like... Bemused. Hey. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, damn, was I supposed to be here? <laughs> I remember thinking he had quite a... He had the exact presence that I would imagine a politician to have. Like at the time I had, uh, you know, nothing but respect for him. I guess a full circle moment <laughs> in a way. <laughs> uh, but he... I don't know. He felt true to what you see on TV, or he, and he he definitely had like a, a presence, you know, mm-hmm. and that was like beyond just him being tall and kind of who he was. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Here is him <clears throat> talking about Glenn Beck, conservative uh, conspiracy who was, theorist. He had the wall pulled over Mormon, his eyes by Mormon. Tim Ballard. <laughs> there were no signs, even though every woman who encountered him saw the signs. But Glenn Beck was completely fooled, couldn't have possibly picked up on it. And yet, how is, is somehow still colluding with Tim and the LDS Church to do? Uh, is that true though, or was that report? outdated? Is I thought that was from before Glenn had his his reckoning with Tim. Um, I'll just blanket say I don't trust Glenn Beck no, as far as neither. I can throw him. In any context. But that was also a moment where, like, oh, we're just at such a moment in culture where anyone reckoning with anything and coming out and saying I was wrong in sort of a conservative space, I just respect the hell out of so much. So when even though Glenn Beck's uh, way that he talked about reckoning with Tim was just a bit, like, eye-rolly, mm-hmm. I was still just like, thank God. Because mm-hmm. that's what we need. We need as many bridges being built as possible. Well... Mitt didn't feel much like bridge building with Glenn Beck. Good. (laughs) Mittens is way too good for Glenn. He said, when Romney met with him, Beck was inexplicably carrying a Bible and a Book of Mormon. Before long, Beck had hijacked the friendly meet and greet and was offering up tearful prophecies about how conservative patriots would rally to Romney's side, evil would be conquered, and the country would be saved from ruin. Wait, he's A similar doing... stick he's given to <laughs> Wait, Tim and Ballard. Mitt Romney's just like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah, literally. Are you just like love bombing right, me right now with your Bible and your prophecies? That's so weird! Yes. Uh, he says, as Beck blubbered, Romney turned to a campaign aide who had, who had accompanied him and mouthed, Never again. <laughs> ah! That also says something about Mitt Romney, that this guy is is like sucking up to him. You know, he's doing mm. these tearful prophecies about his greatness, and that didn't ap- appeal to Romney. No. Very different from the standard Nazi. Like, if you did that yes. to Trump, he'd be so into it. He'd love it. Oh, did Jesus did, in fact, personally call me. He did. Yes, I am the chosen yeah. one. To resist love bombing is an important characteristic for a politician to have, but that we don't see often enough. Oh, you know, it, it's such a refreshing statement. This, this, I have a star on this excerpt because it is in the age of religiously inflated, delusional political narcissism that's just like, I'm God's chosen candidate. God told me to run. I am going to save America. I am going to change everything. Romney is like, has a, a bit of intellectual and spiritual humility, mm. which... It's so great. Which, by the way, is, I mean, obvious point, but a lot of his supporters didn't have that. Like, I I remember being a 20-year-old college kid, and I was like, yeah, God called him to run. He must have, like, met Jesus. Jesus probably told him. Do you know what I mean? Like, I bet the average person, or at least the average Mormon that was supporting Romney didn't have that kind of spiritual humility. So it's very interesting to imagine people putting that onto him and him managing to be like, no, that's not, like... God, what a level of reason we are not used to. Yes. And again, the the Glenn Beck, <clears throat> Tim Ballard comparison is so apt right now, especially considering that Tim Ballard was the de facto successor for 
Mitt Romney's open Senate seat, that he had the the backing of most of the Utah Republican establishment to become senator. And, you know, his whole thing is like, I had a ketamine vision of Jesus who told me that I was going to come to save the, you know, finish the work of Joseph Smith and bring everyone to conservatism and, uh, you know... So then this contract is like, oh my God, they just don't make people like this anymore. Certainly not conservative Mormons. When people call Mitt Romney like a Democrat in sheep's clothing, they're kind of right. The whole time you're like, dude. (laughs) And a lot of his like alliances in the Senate are with Democrats because he like found them more sensible Mm -hmm. than the radicals on his own Mm -hmm. side. Hillary Clinton, I've said this before, but she was known before, you know, the massive slander campaign of her... uh, a presidential run she was known for being such a bridge builder with the republicans mm-hmm. okay so hear this he says he did not feel had never felt that the fates had aligned to place him at this moment in history he did not believe wow. the destiny demanded his ascent to the white wow. house Gorgeous. i am not driven for the presidency like those in history that are written about he reflected in his journal many of his republican opponents claimed they were answering a divine call to seek the office Romney found that this note found this notion ridiculous and grandiose. I love even going, so, yeah, me too. I love him so much. I'm even getting a poster, <laughs> I'm getting his face on a shirt. <laughs> even going so far as to write a mock mock news article. He's a parody news artist, oh, just like us. Pranks, it's first love. Come on the channel, mittens. <laughs> to write a mock news article about it for the amusement of his staff. Oh. Um, on the heels of Herman Cain and Rick Perry both affirming that God himself called them to run for president, Mitt Romney today was overheard in a Palm Beach restaurant saying that God did not call him and did his wife. <laughs> <laughs> he was uncomfortable with ascribing political ambitions to God and doubted whether he cared about elections at all. The question of how much God intercedes in human affairs was, Romney believed, one of life's great imponderables, and he felt it was best to be humble about such things. When the evangelical broadcaster Pat Robertson called him one day to report that God told me you are going to be president, Romney politely demurred. No revel- demurred. I don't know how to pronounce that. No revelation or promptings have come my way, he wrote in his journal. <laughs> Again, just what you want. So just refreshing. What you want. And of course, pr- the average Democratic politician is going to be like, "I was chosen by God." So it's like, yeah, for most people in the world, it's like, of course, you don't have to, like, attribute your campaign to the will of God. But in the conservative Christian yeah. arena, it's just like... I mean, you but you have to be a Christian. You can't even run for president if you're an atheist, right? I mean, basically, you're likely not going to Isn't it true that in, in... I can't remember what it was I heard recently, but it's like in some states, you literally cannot be... Can't even be on the ballot? Yeah, unless you're... A- be interesting if we ever had, like, a Hindu or somebody run. I love that about Mitt so, so much, especially when, again, there's all these forces. It would be so easy for him to just kind of take that on, to absorb that through... So, I mean, if everyone was telling me that... I mean, I'm not <laughs> religious, so it wouldn't work. But, you know, if everyone was, like, love-bombing me and telling me I was, like, the chosen one, I think it would start to get to you after a while, and you'd be like, mm. maybe I am a little bit. But the fact that he stayed resistant to that is so powerful. Yeah. And it is more, you know, when I have read about Obama's decision to run, it seemed like it really did come from a place of like, I'd rather not run for president, but like, I feel like I actually could do a really good job here and make a big impact. And, you know, as opposed to like the, Mm -hmm. that you can have a healthy kind of meant to do this. You can be driven by purpose in a way that's healthy. But the, the fact that all these conservatives just think that, you know, they've been given a vision of pro is just... Something we really need to get away from as a society, and yet we seem to be moving more towards it, which is very scary. It's amazing how God calls five different people to run for president, and none of them win. (laughs) And always the most violent ones as well. Yeah, right? Ooh, uh, here's the story of him being in a meeting with Ammon Bundy, who is a conservative paramilitary activist who had an armed standoff with the federal government in Idaho. So uh, Ammon Bundy started the meeting off with the opening prayer. It says Bundy's prayer went on for five minutes as he detailed a litany of sins committed by the government and petitioned God to mete out justice. When he finished, he was met not met with amens, but a standing ovation. This was an element of Utah politics that was exotic to Romney, a marginal fringe, he told himself. 
and he had no desire mm. to be associated with it. Because he's not from Utah, right? Right, which was another... He was, the sen- he was the senator. Yeah, it was like the day he said he was going to be uh, running for senator, he changed his address on Twitter from Massachusetts to, or just, you know, wherever, to Holiday, Utah. I just assumed he grew up in Utah because he's Mormon and no, was the senator here. No. I mean, he spends a lot of, he spent a lot of time with his kids and stuff yeah, here, but sound like... Sound to EFY. Definitely kind of a carpetbagger. <laughs> like, Good for him. But... Honestly, way better than any other Republicans brought forward by like homegrown Republicans here. Yeah, um, I would vote for him mm-hmm. again over Mike Lee or any other of those hucksters in a second. So Ammon Bundy's praying. They applaud for five minutes, and then it says, "Still, he didn't want to be rude." So when he heard that Bundy was asking for a picture with him, Romney instructed his aides to make sure they never came face to face. At one point, they glimpsed Bundy making his way toward them down the hallway and quickly ushered the candidate through the nearest doorway to hide. <laughs> well, only once they were inside did Romney realize he was in a closet. Oh. How poetic that Mitt Romney had to hide in a closet from a yeah. religious paramilitary activist. That just is. <laughs> the metaphors Mitt write themselves. Romney had to hide in a closet. <laughs> that is the point we are at. He should really be pedestalized by Mormons. Uh, I mean, to just have a man like that representing your religion... They should never want to let that go. Yeah. He sounds so reasonable. It's all relative. Yes. I have shit talked. Caveat from the whole video. I have shit talked centrist <laughs> a lot. Yeah. And, still do. Still and will. And still, like, this moderate centrism of Ronnie, I would prefer, Romney, I'd prefer a million yeah. times over to the uh, extremism of people like Bundy and yeah. Ted Cruz. This, again, he's like, talks about Ted Cruz. He's like, Ted Cruz is a terrifying human being. Uh, all these Republican leaders, terrifying human beings. They're, I would be like absolutely horrified if they got power. And he's like, but at least they're not Democrats because they're worse for some reason. <laughs> oh, get this. He talks about Mike Pence. This was from when he was in the Senate and he's taking a lone vocal stance against Donald Trump. And oh. we'll get more into the Senate later. But um, now having all this context, I'm like, God bless you. They put up billboards in Utah being like, fuck you, Mitt Romney. And then like other people put up billboards that was like, brave patriot. It was like a fucking battleground (laughs) over Mitt doing such a, he also only, um, what, I don't know, like voted yes on one of the two things that Trump was accused for. And it was pretty clear that Trump was guilty of both. Yeah. So it was a very small stand in the (laughs) grand scheme of things. So uh, at one point, Mike Pence pulled Romney aside and was like, you got to be a good soldier and stand up for your team and like, just be, you know, part of the team. And he says, Romney was not persuaded by good soldier appeals, especially (laughs) from the likes of Pence. He found the vice president's brand of sycophancy, sycophancy, which he casually intertwined with Christian moralizing, especially sickening. No one had been more loyal, this is a quote from Romney, no one had been more loyal, more willing to smile when he saw <clears> absurdities, <throat> more willing to ascribe God's will to things that were ungodly than Mike Pence, Romney would not tell me later. And this, and Romney is a man of God who has every reason to see the good in these people. Like yes. he's, he's not some narcissist who just can't bear other people. He seems like a pretty amiable man. So like these are all criticisms where he has everything kind of weighted towards him being biased towards them. And this, this is the whole, like this whole book is him realizing that the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> it's honestly the scariest movie I've ever seen. Because once you're in that system, it's like you, you can't like just get out, you know? Mm. So he's having all these moments, but it, it's scary how it can take an entire career to put pieces together. It seems like he's had to step back before he can put them all together. Oh, it's yeah. just chill. Here is a just a wild little bit. Um, this is sorry we're jumping around chronologically a bit, but um, this is <clears throat> after he's run for president, failed. Uh, he was like, "It's all my fault. I made mistakes. I said binders full of women. I said forty-seven percent of people that are leeching off the government." Which yeah. Wasn't Wait, who snake. said that? He he said that in Romney said what? Basically said that forty percent of people are essentially just going to be leeching off the government regardless What was the binders full of women? And he was saying, my job is to convince the 12% or whatever in the middle to vote for me. Um, And so then, like, a bunch of people were like, that's so... 40% of people aren't on welfare, are they? Yeah, it was a very disparaging remark, somewhat racist, and he lost, like, a huge part of, like, uh, conservative Latino votes and a whole bunch of other people who were like... This is just... That's just... It kind of is almost playing into, like, stereotypical... Racist. And uh, what was the binders full of women comment? Him basically being like, I can't be a sexist. When I was interviewing, I have binders and binders full of women of people I've interviewed and hired, 
which is like a f- okay, but just the concept of binders full of women yeah. was such a funny thing that to this day I still invoke yeah, and laugh about. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Do you mind if I just put the kettle on to make a green tea? Sure. Should we do a little posy? We're back and we have tea. We're talking about him reckoning with the religious religion's role in politics, including his own religion. This is shortly after losing the presidential election, and he's trying to figure out what he wants to do. He's kicking around the idea of being a writer. He finds it too solitary, relatable. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then uh, it says, M. Russell Ballard, uh, famous for, again, (laughs) his aid in the Operation Underground Railroad Scandal and subsequent cover-up. Which we have three videos on if you're interested there in our recent videos. M. Russell Ballard, a senior apostle in the church, asked him to establish a Mormon counterpart to the Jewish Anti-Defamation League. Mormon (laughs) Anti-Defamation League. Could you imagine approaching Mitt Romney and being like, hey. (laughs) So cringe. (laughs) So for those of you who don't know, the Anti-Defamation League was created in the wake of the Holocaust to uh, confront anti-Semitism and bigotry generally in the world. Again, after six million plus people were murdered as a result of bigotry. To then say Mormons need something like that. In the 2010s. In the middle of the Mormon moment. Mitt Romney is the Mormon Mormon moment. The Mormon moment pretty much started during the Olympics, which he was like in the middle of, and then spread into the election where he was the political front runner. He is the Mormon moment in a lot of ways. Coming to him and saying, we need a Mormon anti-defamation I would love to know what was in Elder Ballard's mind in terms of like, what do you think is happening that you would like to prevent? Well, I mean, all these guys, they're, they, I am very cynical about them because they know the reasons people are leaving the church and they choose to just ignore it because they know that openly acknowledging it is just going to turn people away. They know the history is bad. And so they're, what their focus is on is uh, villainizing people who speak out, villainize Mm -hmm. people who speak the truth. And, you know, saying that, like, criticizing the LDS church is akin to anti-Semitism. Oh, and by the way, we're the real Jews. We get patriarchal blessings that tell us we're of the house of Israel. I know. We're the real Israelites. It's like, and then to say that, like, the Native Americans are Jews who travel to America by boat is, like, so fucking racist. Mm. (laughs) Like, the Jewish Anti-Defamation League should be getting on to you guys. Literally. For baptizing victims of Holocaust, uh, victims of the Holocaust after they're dead so that they can be officially Mormons. Oof. Anyway. So how does Mitt respond to that? He said, after looking into it, (laughs) he concluded that the church's most pressing challenges in the 21st century were not misinformation or discrimination from outsiders. They were retaining young people, promoting faith in a secular world, and addressing prickly issues in the church's history. In other words, Romney would later reflect, we have met the enemy, and it was us. Fucking powerful. Mittens. Not Mitt Romney giving more validation to my religious trauma than any bishop, yeah. priest, leader, parent, prophet, teacher yeah. that I've ever met. <laughs> so then has Romney had like a kind of faith crisis? Like what's, where's he at with Mormonism? How did it all? I, it seems like, again, because he's, he's from the East Coast, he has this mm. sort of uh, intellectual liberal approach to uh, to theology where God isn't like, you know, helping you find your car keys and picking the next president. God's just kind of watching us to see how we will act. And Yeah. Um, it's kind of... Uh, there are a lot of Jewish people or Catholics who hold their religion sort of as part of their cultural heritage, but they're not, you know, like in it, in it. And they're mm. not... They're certainly not orthodox. And I didn't necessarily expect that Mitt Romney, for some reason, just the fact that he was like a prominent Mormon, I imagined him being just so, so, so Mormon. He is, and he, he is. Like, I don't mean to say but, that he's not. But I but I would even say the fact that he didn't feel like God was screaming down his neck for him to run. For, like, that alone is like <laughs> such a deviation from the norm. Mm. I just, I know that there are more like reasonable Mormons that exist, but usually not. And I know he's not an apostle, so it is different. Mm. But... Yeah, I don't know. It's it's. I don't think it's like that typical. Mm. This this archetype of. I mean, it's giving East Coast. For it's sure. less and less all the time. His yeah. his brand of Mormonism is definitely sinking. Like it sounds like it's, they're going extinct. He's able to see it as 
you know, his cultural heritage. And so that maybe makes it not feel quite so black and white or like so much of a crisis for him. Whereas for a lot of people, because it's so all in, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, I'm either like leaving and like burning my life to the ground because of it, or I'm all in and God's commanding every single thing I do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it is, I would, I I would love to pick his brain as he was, was the poster child for Mormonism for, you know, years and had, every evangelical in the nation talking about his religion and everybody else too. That was like uh, a huge matter of national conversation was like, should a Mormon who has made oaths in the temple, you know, violent death oaths um, to always follow the prophet is, can we trust that that person is going to do their best or is it just going to be like, okay, whatever the prophet says, which we know is how it works in a lot of Utah politics. This kind of is a good... I don't believe that Mitt Romney would be a hotline from the prophet, though I'm sure he would accept counsel. Yeah. Well, I feel like this is kind of a good example of why... Uh, Because I think in general, part of me has always wanted to be like, yeah, that is kind of, that's crazy to have someone be the president who's made those death oaths in the temple. But it's almost like part of um, why freedom of religion is even like allowed is because we kind of recognize that on some level that it's all a bit silly, or this Mm. is just my interpretation in this moment. And it's like, yeah, everyone doesn't die hard believe their religion's claims. And I feel like this, like I don't, yeah, Mitt Romney doesn't really seem like a threat in that sense. Mm. There are certainly Mormons, you know, Alman Bundy being a being a good example. Better example, yeah. He's actually kind of changed my mind on that one, like in this very conversation. Because I think in general I've been like, no, but now I'm like that would kind of be discriminatory because everyone doesn't believe their religion. Like that is just a fact. Or there's, you know, they're all cafeteria religions. Yeah. Everyone picks yeah. and chooses what things they hold to, what they believe, what they don't believe, how they rationalize. I certain certainly things. don't think we should have like zealous people having power over other people, but you know. Mitt Romney seems not like that. Anyway. Yeah, I would still much rather, in most cases, nine times out of ten, I would rather discuss politics and religion with a believing Mormon than a believing evangelical. Yeah. Just. (laughs) It's all, yeah, person to person it can vary, but I know exactly. When I see evangelicals criticizing Mormonism, I'm like, hey, you weren't invited to the conversation. (laughs) Your criticisms are invalid because they apply just as much to you as to Mormonism. Like I, I'm so sick of it. Don't try and be on my side. Yeah. (laughs) So after, after a failed presidential bid, after being uh, propositioned to create the Mormon Mm anti-defamation league, uh, he gets a a blessing from Boyd K. Packer who tells him that this is just the beginning of his political uh, involvement. And I bet Boyd K. Packer would like for that to be the case. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess Ann Romney said something like, you don't know much about Mitt or politics or something. And Boyd K. Packer said, you don't know much about rebel, about prophecy. <laughs> go, Ann. Ann said that to him? Yeah. It was probably in a very amiable way. Oh, for sure. So then he runs for senator in Utah and... Can I just say, it's it. so, so interesting thinking about the fact that his dad was a politician and it just seems like at every step, Mitt is like not in... in some ways, like, not quite cut out for it, like, just by virtue of the party he's in, I guess, and also just, I don't know, he just seems, like, cooler <laughs> than a lot mm. of politicians, or he seems to have, like, uh, streaks in him that aren't super... Yeah, you get what I'm saying. It's almost... Well, it's almost like he's perfect for it, but the yeah. system that's been built yeah. around it is so horrible, because he does have that, like, mm. executive mind that mm. and uh, that managerial ethos and the ability to manage and to make critical decisions and to balance budget. Like, he has skills that could be leveraged positively. But you know how with a lot of politicians, you kind of feel like they couldn't do anything else but with him it's like you could see him being a writer or a finance guy oh, yeah, yeah. or you could see him doing a lot of different stuff um but it makes it's just interesting thinking about how you know i'm sh- he no doubt followed in his father's footsteps because like all of us follow our parents until we realize the ways that we probably shouldn't mm. and it's just interesting that he took him on this journey sorry yeah i mean he talks about like I mean, he could have followed his dream of parody news and been working for The Onion. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Reductress you know, a... his latest hire. <laughs> that would be amazing. Go on the Benchtopia podcast. <laughs> we were talking about this off camera, but one of, I think, his like campaign strategists he hired, he hired specifically because he had a subversive sense of humor. And you can just tell like he, he craves people 
who can relate on his mm-hmm. level. And especially in the, his time in the Senate seems really, really lonely. I mean, he's in Washington, oh. D.C. most of the time. He doesn't have friends. All no. the people at his party fucking hate him. Even though he's the best. His constituents here in Utah make him feel physically afraid. Like, he's like, he's like God, they uh. hate me here. They want to kill me here. Like, it's scary. Um, and most of his friends in the Senate become Democrats. <laughs> and with and you people can't he be can seen being that close friends, so that oh Exactly. Including just been a writer. Yeah, <laughs> right. Lonely, but at least. <laughs> they talk about his uh, friendship, his most unlikely pairing in the Senate is with a person named is her name Sinema Salema? I forget her name. But she is an ex Mormon and oh. uh, liberal. Oh. And he found in her a, a person who is willing to, you know, across the aisle, uh, coalition it and work together to solve problems. He said Bernie Sanders didn't even respond to his emails. Aww. Bernie just wrote him off. And it's funny that in his mind, Bernie Sanders is like the worst of the re- Democrats because they're just trying to... He, even he talks, now? Yeah. I think he, he sees them as <laughs> the crazies who are just trying to bribe people into voting for them. Bernie? But then, yeah, but then when you look at his criticisms of the Republican Party, for instance, he talks about, like, he got in there and he's like, okay, time to enact the Republican platform of smaller government and balanced budgets and cutting costs. And then he was like, oh, this is not a genuine desire of anybody. I'll, I'll read the line. Yeah. Um, Damn it, I was hoping... I mean, I could understand Bernie not replying to him, given it all. Yeah. But I was hoping... I was low-key hoping for them to form a coalition. I was hoping for Bernie and Mitch to have one cast together. I'll just put my hands up. <laughs> yeah, so he sees he sees Bernie as the like most contemptible of the Democrats Aww. just because of his crazy ideas. But the actual like moral slimeballery of his own party, he is genuinely horrified about. But at least they're on his party. E- but not to, even to this day, or. This is just what he's reckoning with. I don't think he makes any like hard or fast judgments like the, oh, okay. the Democrat Party is better than the Republican. So and he I wouldn't is even at say the that. end of the day well, still actually, a Republican. I, say that, but I keep forgetting that. <laughs> still is a Republican, yeah. yeah. Just like a, a, a more and more rare type. He said in the Senate, there's 20% of them are doing the work and 80% are going along for the ride. Mm-hmm. He saw himself as a workhorse and wanted others to see him that way too. He quickly became frustrated, though, by how much of the Senate was built around posturing and thea- theatrics. They gave Me speeches... Me every job, honestly. Every fucking <laughs> yeah, right. job I've ever had. I get hired as a personality hire. They find out I'm actually terrible to work with. <laughs> and he's like, could, this whole thing could have been an email. Mm-hmm. Um, he said they gave speeches to empty chambers, spent hours debating bills they all knew would never pass. Mm-hmm. They summoned experts to appear at comi- committee hearings only to make them sit in silence while they blathered some more. The hearings were especially irksome to Romney. They're not about learning. They're not about fact-finding. They're about performing, Romney complained. Sometimes I get a little frustrated. If we have someone there who's interesting, why are we giving speeches? Romney was also jarred by the lack of urgency he encountered among many of his colleagues when it came to confronting potentially cataclysmic threats to the country. A devout institutionalist, Romney had harbored a certain subconscious notion that somewhere in the U.S. government, serious people were sitting in rooms drawing up cohesive Mm. plans to address America's long-term challenges. But if those rooms existed, they did not appear to be in the United States Senate. Most of the legislative efforts he learned about were small and scattershot. Mm. Climate change was one issue where this was especially apparent. Like many nationally ambitious Republicans, Romney had downplayed the climate threat for much of his political career. Now freed from the constraints of seeking the presidency, he was ready to roll up his sleeves and get to work on major bipartisan (sighs) solutions to the problem. Again, just so nuts that this looming thing that everybody who devotes like a little bit of basic, like objective research into can see the apparent problems with, that they all have to play down and pretend like it doesn't exist so that they can appease uh, oil executive donors. Freed from the responsibility of doing that, he says... But the senators who were working on the issue seemed consumed with what they considered, what he considered small bore measures that aimed to gradually reduce carbon emissions in the U.S. In Romney's view, delivering the planet from a climate catastrophe would require a massive, well-organized investment in new technologies that prior- prioritize carbon capture and renewable clean energy. When he tried to ask about the logical questions about how to get there, for example, he was met effectively with shrugs and blank stares. In the business world, Romney had made a career of carefully planning and execution. This was not a part of the Senate's ethos. 
It concerns me that we don't have a long-term comprehensive plans, he, that we don't have any long-term comprehensive plans, he said. We don't have a five-year plan. We don't have a 10-year plan. Mm. Everybody in the Senate is just going on how they can get reelected. Yeah. And he talks about that multiple times, even including with our other Senator, Mike Lee, here, how after the Uvalde shootings, um, he spearheaded a cross-aisle coalition effort to reduce... Uh, to enact uh, a certain kind of assault weapons ban. Who did? Uh, Mitt Romney did. Okay. And then Mike Lee shut it down with a bunch of other Republicans because specifically complaining that it would harm their chance of re-election. Right. Dead kids be damned. Ugh. Um, but Rom- I'm like, that's the kind of thing that makes me think Romney should like Bernie Sanders. I feel like if I know. Bernie is the type of person who is willing to just be completely unlikable and unvotable for in the name of his principles. Mm-hmm. He talks about him. Um, I mean, we've criticized Joe Manchin a bunch because he's been so like such a Republican Democrat. Well, he is actually one of uh, Romney's close friends in the Senate, and they have talked about creating an independent party of like rich demo- democratic republican neo republicans literally yeah yeah literally even though it's funny that that's now considered it's like neoliberal republicans yeah, yeah. <laughs> romney encountered a similar attitude when he sought legislative partners to tackle deficit reduction this was an issue that had concerned romney for years he was convinced that unless federal spending were brought into line with incoming revenues america would accelerate toward runaway national debt weakening standing in the world and a painful fiscal reckoning. Conservatives used to at least pretend they agreed with him. Back when he was running for president, Romney had made the deficit a centerpiece of his campaign, and the crowds always cheered when he railed against the Obama's administration's mm. out-of-touch, out-of-control spending. But once Republicans took power, the problem only got worse. Even Paul Ryan, whose 2016 surrender to Trump Romney had treated more generously than others, seemed to have given up on the issue to which he devoted most of his political career. Oh. I feel like it doesn't really need to be said to our audience, but it's crazy that Republicans act like they care about controlling the deficit. Yeah. There's just Or shrinking no the size of the government. Yeah. It's just not true. It's, it's not every, true. Both parties are constantly motivated to uh, sequester and aggregate as much power and spend as much money as, as possible. In a meeting with Republican Senator John, Ron Johnson in January... Romney asked which of their colleagues he should approach about working with him on the deficit. Johnson replied that as much as he shared Romney's concerns, there was virtually no appetite in the caucus to meaningfully cut spending. It was too unpopular. The basic laws of political gravity pushed legislators away from the issue. Great. Yeah. So again, he's, he's very much a platform guy. This idea of like, okay, fis- fiscal conservatism, this is what we're all about, right? Cutting out all the wasteful spending, trimming the fat on the government, getting things in line so we can operate effectively so that we can have you know more uh, prosperity for everybody. And then he gets there and he realizes, oh, these people on my team do not care about mm-hmm. this at all. They don't even care about helping people at this point. Right. They just want to stoke up anger and resentment and violence. Also very interesting because 2012 is when, is I believe when the really big efforts of Republican gerrymandering were happening. Like I've, I think I've read that like basically by 2012, the Republicans had kind of almost guaranteed that they were going to win the, what was the Trump election? I can't remember, 20, was that 2016? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'd basically already guaranteed a win in that election. Mm-hmm through gerrymandering. Like, Ooh. so much gerrymandering was happening at that time. And it's true, because Hillary Clinton got, like, three million more votes than Trump, and Trump won. Ah. So this is all happening at a time where the Republicans really are just focused on getting more and more power and, like, rigging the system in their favor, apparently with no backbone or, like, principles that they even care about other than, yeah, just the amount of re-elected. Power. And then I feel like they stoke their base. The reason the base is like, yeah, slash the deficit is because they... It's, it's the same mindset as the, like, let him die. They just have this idea that the reason the deficit is high is because we're giving people too much, you know, welfare yeah. queens, that kind of thing. But, the, like, that's not what happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, is, this was part of my break from partisanship generally, especially, and leaving the, officially the Republican Party. Though I think I am now re-registered as a Republican just so that I can vote in Utah since there's not an effective Democratic presence mm-hmm. here. But was the realization of, like, oh, they don't actually care about what about limiting spending, about limiting power. 
it's maximizing power, maximizing spending, and what way, in which direction that spending is being pointed. So is, it, is all the money that's being spent going to buy weapons and enrich uh, defense contractors, or is it going to help normal people? And right. that was the Democrat-Republican split that I saw. I was like, oh, anytime they're trying to help people, it's, well, they're welfare queens and evil, and we don't have the money for this. But if we're killing people, we have all the money we need and... Oh my God, there was a TikTok I saw, um, I think it was in the Senate, of Kate, do you know who Katie Porter is? Katie Porter, no. She must be a Democrat based on what this was, but it was her interviewing, I think the CEO of Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. And she was like, how many of your tellers are on government assistance? And the guy was like, oh, I don't know. It's a third. And so she was like, the federal government is subsidizing Wells Fargo like Wells Fargo's wages to the tune of like 900 million a year. Wow. And it, it just shit like that, where it, that, that's just so insane because the Republicans will always say like, you know, no social work. It would be so much more effective to have, you know, like universal healthcare or whatever programs uh, we need that would support people rather than like f essentially just like giving Wells Fargo money that they should be giving their own employees because oh, it's just all so fucked. And so that wasn't a very coherent What point. sucks too is like, uh, you know, the, re the response I could see from conservatives is like, well, a lot of the proposed measures, measures that Democrats are enacting are really just siphoning up a bunch of resources and not actually helping people. And that's a whole other conversation. But, but that's I mean, generally not true. I wouldn't. I mean, it's yeah. We we'd have to get into like specific. There, yeah, that's yeah. big. But like, but I'm like universal healthcare. That's a no brainer. Everyone would save money. Who? who yeah, yeah. Everyone. And who said to us recently, or maybe it was to me, but they were like, living in a country where you don't have that basic fear that you could get sick and it would be a financial burden on you and your like a crippling financial burden for you and your family uh -huh. forever. Uh huh. Just knowing that the government has your That's back and that won't let you time. have them That's like me. makes makes the feeling of living in a place so different. That, I think about that all the time. It was me that said that to Thank you. Thank you, Seven hundred times. It's so true. Like <laughs> the impact on a nation's psyche, knowing that if you get cancer, if you get in a car accident, if you break your leg, that it, it could screw up your life forever. The camera cut out, but I was just saying think what that does in terms of people's willingness to embrace populist leaders who stoke their fear and paranoia and you know it's just like such an easy resource for anyone like trump to co-opt oh yeah because you just can't i feel it and i have like why well, don't i but i don't have good health insurance so that's a wild thing that americans often don't even understand is like even when you do have health insurance here it's still so bad you could still end up having to pay so much money you know thousands in out-of-pocket costs or your deductible is $10,000. Like my uh, like parents, for example, in England can't wrap their heads around the fact that you pay every month for health insurance. And then when you have to use it, you usually still have to pay. <laughs> it's just like slightly less than like total bankruptcy that very day. Like it's mm. just insane. And a universal plan would be a cheaper option for everybody. Yeah, but, it's like instead know. of people are like, oh, why should I fund someone else's healthcare? You're not. Right now you're funding CEO yachts. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, what would you rather? <laughs> exactly. But I genuinely think a lot of Republicans in this country have such a disdain for poor people that they would rather fund the yachts because they, for some reason, see themselves more in that than the people they're actually like aligned with class-wise. Yes, and, and Mitt definitely feels like he's beginning to grapple with that that disparity, but he's I'm still like, obviously a multi-millionaire. I want to see Mitt just like full send Democrat <laughs> campaign. <laughs> That's what we need. I really do feel like it is people like Mitt. It's people that are waking up to the delusions that seem to be running the country. I mean, it's like with cults, the most powerful way to get other people out is dis disaffected members. That's why mm -hmm. cults are so scared of people who leave, why they always try and silence people who leave. It's the exact same phenomenon, like people speaking up about having been inside a system. And like Romney has way more knowledge of this system than the average Republican voter. Mm -hmm. So interesting. This so book necessary. really needs to be like a stark warning for the dangers of tribalism, yeah. especially present in the GOP. You always get comments that will talk about how like the Democrats are a cult too. And I'm like, 
every Democrat I know does not like the Democrats. Yeah, I just... Like, <laughs> tolerates them at best. Like, they, could, they couldn't get us to be cult-like with them if they tried. Like, we don't even like them. Yeah, you, like, the hate that the MAGA crowd has for Biden is so... Yeah. Uh, like, incongruent with the any love that is present in the Democratic Party for Joe Biden. It's like, we all settled for Joe Biden. It shows how much it is just cult of personality for them that they, like, project that onto us. Because I'm like, nobody really likes Biden. I don't know. He's Oh, by the way, Mitt Romney and Joe Biden have a friendship. Of course they do. <laughs> they do seem like Because he finds Joe Biden a much more tolerable yeah. than most of his his party. I do think Joe Biden is probably quite pleasant in the way I imagine Romney to be quite pleasant. Well, and an actual experienced statesman yeah. who's statesman who is interested in issues. And handsome. I mean, they probably can bond over that. Yeah. So many Republicans, <laughs> I know it's not about this, but so Biden many Republican either. politicians just look like something that crawled up from the depths of the ocean. <laughs> so I'm like, they must see the light in each other's eyes, surely. <laughs> like, most mentions about people who are running for office by Mitt Romney, he has the like <clears throat> sassiness of a drag show judge. Like it would be so fun to just sit and roast people with him. Like you can tell he is uh. sassy. Like every single person he's got like a quip for and every single person he talks about is like, oh my God, this person is horrifying. They're an egomaniac. They'd be a nightmare for the country. They're a militant psychopath. You know, he's talking about Rick Perry and uh, pretty much everyone who's run for office recently, he's like, oh my God, I'd be terrified of these people. And it's like, shouldn't that be an indication yeah. to you? I want Mitt to embrace his writer dreams and I want his next book to be about inner child work. <laughs> and I think the reckoning's just begun, Mittens. Also, you finished this, right? I can start reading this yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, so after he uh, loses the presidential race and then after being offered a role in creating the first ever a Mormon Anti-Defamation League and turning that down politely. Job of a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> That's his legacy. Ah! Could you imagine him? I don't know. That's embarrassing that Ballard would even ask. Literally. So embarrassing. That guy is just yeah. one embarrassment after yeah. another. He is a really liability in the Painting quite a bit. Like, usually you don't like learn that much about the apostles, to be honest. They're kind of nobodies, but we're building a picture of him. Yes. This is this bumbling fool in the <laughs> Quorum of the Twelve. So then in 2016, he runs again, right? Um, runs for nominee, and then to oh. everyone's dismay, I mean, not to everyone, obviously not to Mike. I didn't realize he ran in 2016. Is he in the primary debate? He was. And then oh, uh, it brutal. just became clear that Trump was going to take it. And throughout the book, we see Trump's uh, initial meetings with Romney. Romney kind of being like, oh, this guy is funny, but like not a serious person. He, he refers to him as a buffoon multiple times. And then yeah. once it becomes apparent that he is like going to get the nomination, Romney, and this is to his credit, something I didn't realize not being watching him up close during this time, goes full time. Like we have got to take down Trump. He like does he turned against his own party and was like, our full time job has to be to stopping Trump. So he starts writing letters. He starts campaigning like within the party to just be like, we have to do whatever we have to do. He was like, mm -hmm. I will start an independent party and run for office just to weaken Trump's chance of getting the presidency. But then all the strategists were like, no, you'll just you'll just take away from the Democrats. You won't take away from the Republicans. So he decided not to do that. Um, but, but I then, feel like there were a lot of Republicans who didn't like Trump, but they just didn't want to vote for a Democrat. Yeah. And he kind of talks about that, like how like pretty much every, like all the people, a lot of the people in power were like, this guy's a total buffoon. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just showboating constantly. He's a narcissist, an egomaniac. But then one by one, he sees them just falling mm. into line and being like, okay, now we're Trump and we've always been MAGA and we've always been. And he, him just like watching that happen, oh, I think was like, that's so scary. oh shit. Yeah. Very scary. And, uh, then he kind of starts going scorched earth. He writes a letter, which was sort of unprecedented. Um, he said, uh, it says to the students of American presidential campaigns, it was a remarkable moment. There was little precedent for Romney's remarks. The Washington post reported. Never before in modern political history has the immediate past nominee of a party delivered an entire speech condemning the current frontrunner. Wow. 
historian David Greenberg told the New York Times, there probably hasn't been this level of personal inv- invective by one Republican nominee against another leading candidate ever. So then what was the deal with, wasn't after Trump won, they had dinner, you know, there's the infamous dinner picture. Yes. So that's happening after he's done all this campaigning against Trump and Trump knows it? Yeah, so he says Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud, his promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. Yep. He's playing the members of the American public for suckers. He gets a free ride to the White House, and all we get is a lousy hat. Um, and he keeps talking about all of them. He even talks about him wanting to vote for Ted Cruz, even above... Uh, Grim. <laughs> even though before he said that Tim Cruz is like a psychopath, that he'd be like You horrified. always say Tim Cruz. Tim, you Ted, just damn it. it. <laughs> that, so many comments on that other video where you were like trying to explain to me... And you were like, you know this guy. And I was like, no, never heard of him. And I'm like, I just couldn't imagine anyone not saying Tim Ted- Cruz, his frenemy twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he starts, he starts campaigning. He does that speech and then runs for Senate. Oh, he kind of, he kind of was like, okay, I've lost out on this big political position, president. Now Trump has it. I see everyone in my party just <clears throat> going in full <clears throat> conformity mode, bowing down, kissing his ass. And he kind of had this idea, and I remember thinking about it at the time it happened of like, okay, yeah. do I just yeah. walk away try and build or do I try to mitigate the damage that I know yeah. is coming? I mean, it's like Bernie, right? Like the, Dem- the Democrats really screwed Bernie over in the primaries, but at the end of the day, uh, I think he's a consequentialist and the other option was Donald Trump. So he was willing to, you know, yep. do what had to be done. Uh, and then he also ended up becoming the chairman of the... Senate Budget Committee House? I can't remember. Yeah. But it's like Bernie's been able to achieve more and help more people yes. by just, yeah, sucking up. <laughs> yep. And that is the way that the <clears throat> political game is played, unfortunately. So um, But he did, and he talked about that meeting and how he just was like, he, he had just loathed Trump at this point, and he knew that he was going to go in, that he was going to be, like, look like a total idiot. But he's he like, was willing to do it just yeah. to try and have some shred of God. And I mean, who among us hasn't tried to appeal to a narcissist that, we've, <laughs> that we already know? It's just on the off chance, you know? Yeah. <sighs> and of course, it just played out exactly how we knew yeah. it would. Trump just, just using make... it as a, as a way of humiliating him, getting him to... He, they required Mitt to make some kind of statement, and he really was like, this is the best I can say is like, I will see if Trump can do what he promises to do. But then by arranging that meeting, they were kind of able to get Mitt to stop taking such a public stance. It was... Damn it! Definitely a maneuver that worked for Trump. Okay, this is interesting to hear about, though, because I just assumed, oh, Mitt... I I knew really very little about Mitt Romney, and so I just thought, oh, he's such a coward. Like, he's just trying to, like, get a good job. And now I'm realizing, like, it doesn't seem like any of this is about just, like, getting a good job for Mitt Romney. It feels like he really does come from a set of principles that he's trying to see through in whatever ways he can. Yes, and he, but he is also very self-aware about the parts of him that do just want the job. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. And, I think it would But be... I think he's genuinely motivated to like... Yeah. I mean, who is completely uninterested in their own success? Like, that's pretty... They would. It's only good. the narcissists who think they're not, that they're only following yeah, God's will. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but it, you just, I think if you, it, yeah, it's just about having awareness of that part of you that seeks status and success, yes. and then it doesn't sit in the driver's seat. But as we learned from our status game video uh, and that book review, you, it's impossible for humans to not care about status. It's just wired into us. Yep. Um, and again, seeing the kind of behind the scenes of how much he launched into trying to yeah, thwart I didn't Trump, know that. I was very, very impressed and was like, damn, like, damn he leave us hanging he was really and it's pr- trying to help. presumably that that's pro bono work. I mean, you're not really like gaining anything. You're not getting paid for that. Or no, he's dumping kinda, his own political yeah. fortune, which you know for him it's yeah, drops in rich. the bucket. But yeah. um, become a patron, Mitt. <laughs> 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 we would love to have you become an angel investor. No, we have to know you can use an alias. <laughs> so then he's working in the Senate, and in the Senate, you know, the opportunity to um, impeach and indict Trump comes up, and he's the only Republican senator who takes a stand on that. Um, It says, Romney had made up his mind. He would vote to convict Trump on Article 1, abuse of power, and acquit him on Article 2, obstruction of Congress. So uh, if I'm remembering correctly, this was related to Biden and uh, Ukraine, where Trump put pressure on Zelensky to investigate Biden, 
and Romney was saying that was um, an abuse of power, but he wasn't necessarily guilty of obstructing Congress. So he was trying to have a principled thing, which was like, you're guilty of this specific thing Mm -hmm. and not this. I'll only push on the thing that's specific and not just be like, I'm just going to try to get you out just because I hate you. But Trump was guilty of the other thing too. Well, Mitt Romney didn't think so. He thought it was that one thing. Sound off in the comments if you know more Um, about that. And he says... uh, This conclusion came with a stomach-twisting awareness of the potential repercussions. Turning once again to his journal, he wrote, The Utah Republicans that had nominated me would go crazy with anger. My colleagues in the Senate would have nothing to do with me. It would affect my ability to get any legislation passed. I'd get nothing done through the administration, of course. The president would attack me mercilessly in his rallies, incentivizing some nut job to shoot me. Fox 2 would eviscerate me, stoking up the crazies. The president might seek revenge, perhaps by using government in some way to hurt my sons. I would lose some friends who are Trump supporters, though not my few close friends. Mm. For the rest of my life, I would be accosted by people who would hate what I had done. If I just vote with my party, my vote would would be expected, and people would dislike Trump would just dismiss me as a callous Republican. But voting against party would engender true enmity and vitriol. It would be hard to go anywhere, especially in Utah, yeah. without the possibility of encountering some vocally hostile abuse. Yeah. This would be true to a lesser degree for my sons, particularly Josh. God, that's I might so need to move brave. from Utah. Is what, how Definitely would move from Utah. Being a Mormon conservative politician standing yeah. up for, for your morals that your church instilled in you, at least Especially you Especially when they have the whole, like, the Constitution will be hanging by a thread and a Mormon white horse guy will save it. I'm like... Mitt Romney, that's Mitt. If not Mitt, then who? I know, it's funny how I did not believe that as a Mormon, and then after a Mormon, I was like, there could be something to do that. (laughs) Honestly, it's so wild to me how the Mormons turned on Mitt because they were so taken in by the cult of personality of Trump because their religion is so stale and Trump was sexy and fresh and, you know, it was like something modern they could get behind. Oh, God, that's so real, though. Like, the... The fact that he even knows that you know it's going to stir up some right wing nut job to shoot him. Like he, it's he's had a valid. he's had a reoccurring like fear his whole life of being killed, oh. and almost this like foreboding sense that someone would try to kill him. I mean, so have I. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and it's like that for him is like a very yeah. real consideration. And oh. for what? Like to help people who literally just don't care. That like he's <laughs> like so. I'm again. This is not to. Uh, you know, obviously Mitt Romney has done a lot of shit, but he just seems so uncontroversial relative to everything else that's happening around that it, oh, it's just mind blowing how the Mormons turned on him. It really is. Yeah. So as a Senator, he continued to fight Trump and he also was like very adamant about, um, confirming the first black democratic female judge to the Supreme court. Um, the, I think one or only one of two Republicans who did that. And his thing was like, we have to look at our legacy. Like Mm. you do not want to be on the wrong side of history in this. And he said that he like just analyzed her like he would any other judge and was like, she seems Mm -hmm. competent, even though she's not in my party. Mm -hmm. Again, a man of principle and (sighs) always thinking about the future and legacy and being on the right side of history. I know it's obviously probably just so many different factors, but I'm like, what is it about Mitt that somehow gave him this extraordinary measure of immunity against that party tribalism when every other Republican wouldn't, wouldn't like, vote with integrity? That's wild. Like, mm. he really, he's so special. <laughs> yeah, he says that um, senators who were, like, publicly very MAGA, very well, uh, would come up to him in private and be like, I wish I could express my opinions like you do, but... Don't uh, be a politician if you're that fucking spineless. That's what drives me mad. They all are, though. Like, the I vast know. majority are. <laughs> like, the problems our world is facing is tribalism. At its core, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. So that's why I feel like we, you know, we, we, you can respect any politician that's, like, willing to stand up against that. Like, the Bernies, the Romneys. Can't really name that many others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this book is both really insightful... Um, into the state of American current American politics and the trajectory that especially conservative politics have have taken, the rise of MAGA and this like 
violent, embittered faction of the country that is like very pro-authoritarian, very anti-liberal values. And I'm talking like freedom of press, freedom of speech, even freedom of religion, because it's Mm -hmm. very like Christianity needs to be the supreme religion and everything else needs to be subservient to that. You know, it's like, it's just really interesting to see through his eyes. And while like validating in a lot of ways of being like, yeah, that's exactly what I thought about all those people and all those things He'd too. Rather it, wasn't. it is kind of maybe not a little too late. <clears throat> like you only know how much, you know, as you go on, but it is kind of scary because there's no resolution. It's like, okay, well, Trump is still somehow, even after being proven a fraud, even after mm-hmm. breaking uh, court decisions and, you know, all this, he's still the front runner the sort of de facto front runner that's being... And after being found guilty of so many crimes. How is that even possible? And people like Tim Ballard are still leading successful business can... lives even after having, you know, yeah. total fall from grace. You can grace. commit the smallest crime and be in prison for it. And then these people can just do the most heinous things that affect millions of people's lives. Oh, he talks about the the rise of hucksters and criminals in the Republican Party. How it's like, mm. oh, being a criminal isn't even a deterrent from b- holding office as a Republican. It's like it's encouraged now. Yeah. Like it's just showing that like you don't have you don't respect the traditions of this system that needs to be burned to the ground or you know however they see it. I think what's so scary is you know coming back to you were saying Mitt would try to take people in good faith when they would tell him, you know, they cared about the deficit or they cared about all these things. You, you can't find a better bridge builder and he wasn't able to be successful. That's what scares me is he was willing to, because I think a lot of the time I think about, you know, how are we going to combat the Christian nationalism and all the extremism in the country? And I always imagine like, well, it's bridge building. And, you know, it's like seeing the best in people's sort of words and intentions and but but he did that and had a, you know a big platform and a lot of power through which to do it and like it didn't matter well it did matter because yeah. they trump was indicted and yeah. he was able to build bridges just not within his own party with other people but trump was indicted people. but like now he could still be the president again <laughs> what does it even mean to be indicted i don't even know <laughs> Does nothing happen to Trump? Like, it just seems like there's constantly all of these things he's found guilty, his lawyers pleading guilty, like, all this stuff is happening. <laughs> but nothing will change. What the hell is up with the system where, like, he, he's not... I just don't get it. Oh, yeah, and if something, you know, if, if somebody does something in pursuit of electing a president that's totally illegal, once the president gets in office, boom, 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 boom par- just handing out pardons yeah. oh. to Roger Stone and Steve Bannon and, you know, whoever else. It's grim, yeah. but at least he's reckoning... And yeah. people like us are yeah. being like, okay, maybe these stark divides that I had, you know, these assumptions about Mitt Romney or other people, you know, maybe there is room for mm-hmm. for people changing their mind, for changing their affiliations, for owning up to mm-hmm. the ways that their own groups are being harmful. Because I think a lot of the time people are like, but I can't leave my group because the other group hates me. So I think it... Yeah, I, I he, think it's important that he people wrestles like with us that too. Because <laughs> he's like, I made all these new Democrat friends by criticizing Trump, but then went right back and signed off on some Republican, you know, a conservative thing, and now they don't like me again. Yeah. He like kind of likes being the controversial diva, I think. Mm, oh, does he? Yeah. He's, they said in his his uh, group chat, which includes several Democrats, Gorgeous. that he's the most chatty one. <laughs> <laughs> he's like abusing the group chat. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with him. I, I feel like that. if I had a conversation with Mitt Romney, I would genuinely yeah. like him as a person. Yeah, would be for sure. And I don't usually say that about politicians. No. I also think it's good to, again, because everything is just so tribal right now in America, it's good to frame the conversation around values rather than party. And so when you see integrity, even if it comes from a person that, you know, isn't the full picture of what you would hope for in a politician, mm-hmm. we have to celebrate that. Yeah. Because otherwise, like, people will stay in that camp because they're like, well, if I leave, then it's hard to leave a cult without a support system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's hard to leave a tribe and just go off into the woods to be alone because you're going to die. So people need to feel like there's going to be an invite. And I think, not necessarily speaking, like, as a Democrat, but, like, if Democrats do want to be more, I don't know, effective, I just think something they could do is, like, promote the kind of empathy that they want to see on a policy level in conversations like this. And none of this is to say that we shouldn't, criti- you know, he supported the Iraq war and sure. you know, a, a bunch of bullshit. And, but yeah, we love someone who reckons we really do. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's, it's making me 
helping me question um, my like ideological puritanism. Yeah. You know, because in a lot of ways, I, I mean, this you see this on Twitter all the time, where it's like to support this person is to give a blanket, con- you know, mm-hmm. uh, support of genocide or torture of babies or this or that, and it's like. Unfortunately, that's just, the world is way more complex than that. And it's like, even if, you know, even people who at one time were like wanting to defend abortion and gay rights and uh, universal health care for political pragmatism, for like merely the desire to get things done, Mm -hmm. have to buy into certain group thinks and yeah. certain lines party have to toe certain party lines and unfortunately that is just the way that politics works today yeah. and I wish it weren't that and way it but it is truly all fucked all the way down <laughs> and we don't have to stop criticizing the other thing you know we don't have right. to become passive or, or just but if it's just kind of the thing of like no one's all good or all bad we just have to you know like call out the good and the bad well I like what Romney said first of all about how the president has like less impact than you think yes that's just seems <clears throat> true for me for like because how could one person yeah it's yeah. just insane um but I always think about how Obama was so focused on healthcare for the same reason that Romney was because that is the 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 way to impact the most people. Mm. So that was his kind of singular focus as much as you can have a singular focus while president. And then like every president isn't, isn't like a genius in every area. Like, or hyper involved. Like for example, I always think Obama being complicit in a lot of civilian bombings and stuff. I always wonder like how much power he had in that situation. Like I truly don't know. Or I wonder how much he felt like he had to defer you know, to these military experts so that the Republicans wouldn't... Well, they were already blocking every single thing he did, but do you know what I mean? It's just... I I just don't think anyone has as much power as we would like to think they do. And I genuinely am curious whether someone could get into the office of the presidency and have the power to, for example, like, stop civilian bombing efforts when all the military generals are like, we should do this. You'll go the way of John F. Kennedy. Well, yeah, Ball and the t- the exactly, and the like the type of person that would do that, Bernie Sanders, blocked from the candidacy, and yeah. so that's yeah, that's sort of chilling to think about. Yeah, when you have a you know a decade long or sh- shorter in uh, Barack's case, but uh, military campaign that is integral to both America's wartime yeah. economy, which is you can't receiving... just come in and be like, we're not doing that anymore, guys. <laughs> yeah. We're actually doing pacifism now. No, it was like, like great, nice to know you. Bye. The fucking American economy is being upheld by this military. And it's just a nightmare. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. so I think, uh, yeah. And I don't say any of this to be like, it was fine that Obama did, but it's just like, I think we do have to be realistic about like the systemic change that needs to happen. Like, as we always say, mm-hmm. because I just, cannot imagine like I don't imagine Obama was sitting there like yeah let's drop the bombs this is awesome it's like probably either like wasn't involved that much wasn't even able to be involved I don't know I I didn't know that even uh, when the nominees before they're even elected they're briefed by the military Mm. to be like if you make it here's some stuff you need to know even before this is the strategy yes there's so that they don't get into office and then like literally ruin the country because they're so scared that they like speak out or something yeah or being like trump and talking about military operations on the phone with random people or what a clown very cool (laughs) this video is so long and this is the point where we need to urge you to please support the channel on patreon because we only can continue doing this through Patreon, that is our primary source of income. We don't really make much money from YouTube. Unlike Mitt Romney, we did not <laughs> inherit a fortune, nor work in a venture capitalist firm gutting companies and firing people. <laughs> no, and that's why I can't wait for Mitt to join us on Patreon, because... He'll be our... With one favorite. small million dollar loan, he could change our lives. Truly. Um, and it is it is genuinely true that we rely on Patreon to be able to keep doing this. This is not sustainable without Patreon, so we really appreciate those of you who do support us there, and it's fun. Thanks so much for We're watching. We're reading 80s Mormon fiction. Yeah, and it is a good time. Way more fun than this. Yeah, although I kind of had fun in a weird way with this one. I did too. It was too. very interesting. This, I read this book like start to finish in like two days. Just like, I think I'm going to give it to my family for Christmas. I think they will like it. I think I'm going to give it to my family. It's like a really solid my sort of fam- like Mormon family book. classically liberal, conservative family. Mem- then, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, thank you all for joining. I uh, can't wait to read the comments. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people with things to say, so... Keep it civil. (laughs) Uh, We've never claimed to be anything but bimbos. And we love you. 
Okay, bye. Bye.